Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this web lecture in which I will introduce to you the European Union competition law. European Union competition law traditionally is composed of three domains in which we try to make companies behave in accordance with the idea of a free market economy. Um, what we want to establish is fair competition and we do that by first uh, the, introducing the prohibition of cartels which is um, uh, stipulated in Article 101 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Second, by um, uh, making sure companies do not abuse their dominant position, which you can find in Article 102 of the TFEU. And third, making sure that concentrations are still in line with the idea of a um, fair and uh, free market economy. And this is dealt with in Council Regulation 139-2004. I will briefly explain all those three um, uh, to give you an impression of how European Union competition law actually works. First, I'd like to explain how a forbidden cartel works and I will use a four-step approach um, in order to do so. The first step is that we have to figure out if two or more market participants distort the competition in some shape or form. Um, the definition of a distortion of competition can be found in Article 101 of the TFEU. Um, an example could be by artificially increasing or lowering prices. That's a very famous um, form of a uh, distortion of the competition. Once we've established this, um, we could go to the second step, and that is, um, is there a cartel? Um, and to clarify that a little bit, we can make a distinction between, on the one hand, an agreement to a cartel, and on the other hand, to concerted practices that pretty much are a cartel. Um, let's take an example. What if Animal here um, ends up in an agreement with Miffy that they want to artificially increase the prices of their company uh, because they both sell dead fish? And as they always say, the only good fish is a dead fish. So they sell the fish and they um, agree with a written agreement um, that they want to increase the prices from the next month onwards. Well, this is simply an agreement um, and, well, this is most of the times always forbidden. However, probably they are not so stupid to write this down on a piece of paper so that actually the European Commission can find out. So maybe they do not agree on that, but they behave accordingly. Now, if the behavior as such, even though we cannot figure out if there is an agreement or not, comes down to a cartel, um, they can still be held liable for actually uh, engaging in a forbidden cartel. The European Commission is authorized not necessarily to figure out if they can find evidence of the agreement in itself, but if their behavior as a concerted practice dictates that there must be a cartel, then this is actually enough um, to, to find them. So if they secretly hold a meeting in a hotel room and whisper to each other, let's increase the price from next month onwards and no one will find out that it's actually us who agreed on that, and the market behavior shows that they both all of a sudden increase the price for no reason, then the European Commission can still find them because this is a concerted practice and that must be a cartel. Now, once we've established that they distort the competition and they are in a cartel, we have to um, examine a third uh, feature, that is, are we talking about undertakings here? An undertaking is an entity on a market that employs economic activity. That is not necessarily a company. It could also be um, a part of the government. For instance, um, when the German government uh, upholds a network of job agencies and it's actually financed by public funding, if these job agencies are actually making money, then they are still considered to be an undertaking and they also still have to uh, take into consideration the rules around a forbidden cartel, that is Article 101 TFEU. Um, when it's just about companies, then they are of course obviously an undertaking, so the third issue will not be much of an issue. Um, however, um, it's interesting to um, to, to reflect on the word undertaking because it has a much broader scope than just the word company. Now, there is also a fourth um, issue that could help you, that could in this case help Miffy and uh, Mr. Animal perhaps. Um, 
at some point, sometimes, there will be exemptions to these rules, to the above rules, and you will get away with a cartel. For instance, if you can prove that at some point your cartel is really necessary for technological innovation, which you cannot establish without the cartel, because then maybe you can simply not finance the technological innovation. Um, but it should at some point always at the end benefit the consumer. So this will be assessed by the European Commission when you are in such a cartel. Um, a second reason why you might be excused for being in a cartel is, is when you have no, um, when it leads to no substantial distortion, and this is most of the times the case when you have a relatively small uh, market share of the relevant market. Um, the European Commission musters as a rule of thumb a percentage. In case of a vertical cartel, um, the combined market share should not exceed the threshold of 15%. Um, a vertical cartel is, for instance, a producer to retailers. If a producer would say, well, I'm going to increase this, uh, the sales price and uh, demand that the retailers do the same thing, that would be a vertical cartel. Now, if the combined uh, market share does not exceed 15%, then you will get away with the cartel. A similar percentage is there for horizontal cartels, and then um, the threshold would be, as a rule of thumb, 10%. That would be, for instance, if all supermarkets agree jointly to increase the price of peanut butter. Well, that is a horizontal cartel. If the combined market share does not exceed the threshold of 10%, you'll get away with the cartel as well. Um, one last thing, there is this little tricky rule in the cartel business, so to say, which is called the leniency policy. That is, when you are in a forbidden cartel and you are the first um, to inform the European Commission about this, then you get away without a fine. So that's really tricky, so think twice before you engage in a cartel, because maybe you can't trust Mr. Animal and he will actually, um, you know, inform the Commission. A second feature of European Union competition law is the prohibition to abuse your dominant position. Think about uh, monopolists who abuse their monopoly position. Um, also here we have a step approach, a three-step approach this time, um, through which we can assess whether or not you are abusing your dominant position. Uh, a first step is to reflect on your behavior. Could your behavior be qualified as abusive under the European Union law? Well, in this case, we'll have to consult Article 102 TFEU that provides us with a list of potential abusive behavior. Also here, for instance, um, suddenly increasing or decreasing a price uh, with, uh, with no reason uh, could be labeled as abusive behavior. Um, an argument to increase your price could be, well, there are no competitors, so I can ask the price any price I want. Um, uh, an argument to decrease your price all of a sudden is to make sure that potential newcomers at your market will find it very difficult to actually enter the market because they cannot compete with you due to your low pricing. A second feature is, do I actually have a dominant position? Well, this is um, mostly open for debate and it will pretty much depend on the particularities of the case and will be assessed by the European Commission. And if you disagree with the European Commission or its judgment, you can always appeal uh, to the Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice. However, the European Commission uh, has a certain threshold they keep in mind to define the word dominant position. And this threshold most often is when your market share of your business exceeds a threshold of 50%, then you are labeled as an organization that has a dominant position at a given market. Please uh, mind you, having a dominant position as such is never forbidden. You can be successful in the European Union. However, abusing your dominant position, that is exactly forbidden. Now, a third element um, which closely relates to the second element, the dominant position, is to figure out what actually is the relevant market. It makes a great deal, if I'm talking about the banana market or the fruit market in general. Uh, obviously, the banana market is much smaller compared to the fruit market, so I will uh, more easily have a dominant position on the banana market compared to the fruit market. This is always uh, a, a subject for debate between the company who is accused of abusing its dominant position on the one hand and the European Commission um, up accusing a company of this behavior on the other hand. Um, obviously, the European Commission will mostly um, reason that the market is much smaller, so you have this dominant position, uh, where the business will mostly uh, argue that the market is much bigger, so you do not have this dominant position. Now, 
um, a, a very simple example uh, uh, would be if I sell onions, um, is that the same market as fish? <laughs> Probably not, but anyway. Um, there is a computer model the European, sh European Commission might use to figure this out, which is called um, the small and significant but non-transitory increase in price test. This means that we will artificially increase the price of onions and then figure out if people will basically buy any substitute product, say fish. If the answer is yes, they will buy fish instead of onions, because it looks alike or something like that, um, then we have to conclude that the market is way bigger than just the onion market. If the answer is no, they still buy the onions, even though the prices are higher, then we have to conclude that the onion market is just the onion market, and that's about it. Well, this is just one way to basically figure out what your relevant market is, and it is actually a matter of reasoning. Um, so this test might help you out a little bit in, in figuring that out, but it's, it's, it's not um, conclusive as such. So it's, it's still a matter of uh, legal debate what exactly the size is of your relevant market. And this has, in the meanwhile, led to a very colorful chain of case law in which the European Court of Justice tries to define these concepts. A third element of European Union competition law is the idea that at some point a concentration might also lead to a distortion of the market. Um, a concentration is when two or more organizations join their efforts in jointly participating in the economy. That could be, for instance, a merger, but it could also be a long-established joint venture or something like that, or a takeover, whatever you name it. Um, the concentration is actually the general concept in which we try to address these particular things. Um, we have to ask the approval for the European Commission to actually engage in such a concentration when we com uh, comply with two demands. First of all, the worldwide combined turnover of the concentration to be exceeds a threshold of 5,000 million euros. And second, the EU turnover, so that is on EU soil, uh, of at least two of the undertakings exceeds a threshold of 250 million euros. Uh, when you comply with both of these uh, prerequisites, you'll have to ask the approval of the European Commission. Now, the European Commission will launch an investigation and figure out whether or not your concentration to be will have a negative distorting effect um, on the uh, EU trade. And if that is the case, the concentration uh, will not be allowed. If it's concluded that the concentration in itself will not have a negative effect um, on, on a, a free and fair market of the European Union, then your concentration will be allowed and you will have a permit to do so. Now, to conclude, we've just explored three versions of EU uh, competition law. We've explored a four-step approach uh, towards um, the prohibition to cartels in Article 101 TFEU. We have explored a, uh, how to figure out in three steps whether or not I'm abusing my dominant market position in the European Union under Article 102 TFEU. And here we figured out uh, what should be done um, before we actually engage in a concentration at the European Union markets. Thank you very much for watching and good luck with studying European Union law.